Are we on, Paulina? We are on. Are you expecting anyone else as a um, as a That's special just, guest? No, it's just me. Okay. We have. It looks like we have about fifteen participants. Yep. And you have Russ Baxley is raising his hand. Would you like me to allow him to talk? Um, let me just welcome everyone for a second, and we can certainly uh, get into it. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, th thank you for joining our monthly Red Feather Lakes Community Conversation virtually. I I'm really looking forward to when we can have one of these in person. Uh, maybe we'll have that option in August. We can talk more about that. So we have about 15 participants. Uh, Paulina is from our IT department. And I think it would be best to give her a moment or two to share how this uh, works and how folks can participate. I did have a, a couple of things that I wanted to update people on. I can be brief and then really open it up for questions. And I know we had at least one person with a raised hand. So with that said, uh, Paulina, would you give us a quick overview of how this works? Yes, so this is a webinar. So, um, one of the things that's a little different about a webinar versus the uh, normal Zoom meeting that you might be used to attending is that we will not see your faces, uh, so your video will not work. Um, even if we do allow you to talk or you decide to talk, um, we will not see your face. And in addition to that, you will have to raise your hand if you're on video or on uh, the, the web version of this, or you will have to hit star nine if you have a question and would like to speak. That will let us know that you wanna speak and it'll raise your hand uh, in the attendees queue. In addition to that, we also have the Q&A area uh, that you will see. And if you have any questions, you don't feel like speaking, but you would like to have a question given to John to answer or comments or feedback or anything like that, feel free to do so through there. And we can make sure that he gets that or that we have the question answered. Um, I think I covered everything, John. Did I miss anything? I think you're good, Paulina. And at this time we have 17 participants, so that's great. If, if you'll allow me, I, I'd just like to maybe take five minutes to give you some updates, which I think are, are, are relevant to folks. And also some of these updates are in response to uh, questions uh, that I received ahead of time from uh, at least one person in particular, Gordon. Oh, there's Michelle. Oh, <laughs> but I made it. I'm sorry I'm late. We were having some IT issues and luckily Paulina jumped on, was able to start the meeting for me, but we figured it out and so I'm here. All is well. I, I'm, Thank I'm you, okay. Paulina. No problem. I'm, I'm very grateful for the two of you. <laughs> so I was just saying, Michelle, Paulina has explained how this platform works. I think folks are uh, getting um, their skill set is increasing with these platforms. And I was about to give a quick um, update on a, a few key topics, including some of the questions that were presented to us ahead of time. So I'm gonna to try to do that in less than five minutes and then open it up for questions and, and, and dialogue and, and to find out exactly what's on people's minds. Um, the, the first set of updates I wanted to give were related to the, um, the thing that's on, on our minds for a lot of us, the COVID-19 uh, situation. And one of the things that's really important for people to be aware of is that recently, maybe as of yesterday uh, or, or Tuesday, uh, we have updated our website, our COVID-19 website, and there's now this, quote, data dashboard. And if you haven't seen it, it was in the newspaper today, they did provide a link. I'm sure Michelle or Paulina can provide you a link, but I think it's a really, really informative tool uh, for folks to understand you know, what the county health department is considering, the factors, the early warning indicators that we are um, constantly monitoring uh, in, in terms of how we are progressing forward with you know, opening up businesses, allowing people to get together and, and be outside and everything else. Uh, one of the things on this data dashboard is it has a, um, a sort of a, a clock or something or a, or a gauge and it, it assesses a risk factor. And it, it shows, for example, that we're in the, there's low, medium and high, and we're in the medium uh, section of this, of this graphic 
And, and that is based on a composite of what we call early warning indicators that are everything from uh, new positive tests to trends over uh, a three-day average to hospitalizations, uh, use of intensive care units and all of that. And if you go to this dashboard, you'll see that all of these indicators are in a good place right now, which is not to say, once again, as Tom Gonzalez always says, uh, we, we have made great strides in flattening the curve, the, the, the proverbial curve. However, uh, we're not out of the woods because that thing could, could spike up again if we don't do things wisely and, and carefully. We're seeing in about uh, half the states in America where there have been some increases in positive COVID-19 cases. We've seen a little bit of that in some of the other counties in Colorado, but Larimer County is in good shape. And I wanna draw your attention to that data dashboard. It's really, really a good tool. The second thing I'd like to mention is um, a lot of questions around, uh, gosh, there's Michelle and Paulina, they're the best. And, and you could take a look at this. And if you have questions later on, uh, you know, please ask and I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, it, it is telling that our infection rate, you know, right now we're providing information on the, the, uh, the, the normal uh, COVID-19 testing. And then we have the, the blood testing, the ser serology tests, and all of that is being broken out. And you can see that in terms of the COVID-19 uh, infection rate, I think we're something like at about 3.9% uh, or something like that. So th these are really important. And this guides uh, local public health folks in, in coordination with the state, you know, what we're monitoring and, and, and you know, how we feel confident, thank you, how we feel confident, you know, to move forward on, on allowing for um, more mass gatherings. Uh, yesterday, the governor expressed concern a little bit and, and just asking, pleading with folks as the 4th of July holiday comes up, uh, you know, to just be really smart about how we're gonna get together to celebrate our nation's birth. Uh, on the topic of schools, uh, from previous uh, newspaper stories, uh, it, it was indicated that the school district was looking at four options. The one option that was kind of rising to the, to the top was this quote hybrid model where when the schools start up again in August, uh, the, the students, the, the children, would be in the classroom two days a week and um, uh, online two days a week. And, and so that was the, the sort of the prevailing scenario that was being considered based on surveys, based on feedback that they'd gotten from families and students. Uh, the county has been encouraging, uh, perhaps pushing the school district to look at 100% opening of classrooms. And so we're in the process of figuring out uh, you know, what needs to be in place in order for that to happen. And frankly, that's something that I'd like to see happen because a lot of children don't have the best access to high-speed internet. A lot of children don't learn best by online learning. So just be aware that there are a lot of discussions going on. The health department is working with the school district, including Thompson School District, including Estes Park School District, including the, uh, the mountain schools like, like up in, in Livermore and Red Feather Lakes and Stove Prairie to see how we could possibly open up the schools uh, 100%, you know, obviously practicing public health protocols. On the matter of school buses, uh, you know, I think there was a story that said, based on the current guidance, we could only get like 10% of the kids, you know, get on a school bus to get to school. And this includes kids with special needs. Well, again, if we can uh, get our uh, variances approved and we can work with the school districts and the state, uh, this also could change. The last thing I'll mention on this, I'm, I guess I'm going over the, um, the darn five minutes, but it's important for folks to know that we are looking forward. I've mentioned this before, but there is this thing called the Long-Term Recovery uh, Collaborative, an action plan. And we have a variety of county staff We've, we've hired someone working with United Way and we're de we've developed this framework and it's been recently refined. But the idea is that we are working with all the various public and private sector partners to look at what we need to do, you know, to move forward four months from now, you know, when the schools open up and six months from now and beyond. And, and that's something that folks should be watching this up. We're calling it the Larimer County COVID-19 Collaborative Recovery Plan. And one of the things that would be an opportunity for you to participate or engage is, at some point we're gonna be sending out a questionnaire uh, based on the four focuses, uh, excuse me, the four areas of focus. There are four areas of focus, and then there are various sector task forces. But the questionnaire will go out to key folks, and if you're interested up there in the mountains, because we wanna get that, that input, 
uh, the questions are trying to identify unmet needs. How are things going before the pandemic issue came before us? And how are things now? And what is it that folks need moving forward? So please be aware of that. And the next thing I'd like to update you on is the broadband strategic initiative. Uh, and, and this relates to one of the questions that um, I think Gordon posed about uh, some of the activity that CenturyLink is doing in the Glacier View Meadows area. So the, the thing that's most noteworthy about the broadband strategic initiative, and in my opinion, this is very exciting, uh, and, and that is it's starting July 1st, which I believe is next Wednesday, for six weeks, we will be going live with our um, uh, bandwidth uh, uh, speed test and survey. So there is a website, and I actually have it. It's, um, uh, what is it? It's speed, what the heck is it? speedtest.larimer.org. Hopefully I have that right, Paulina. Uh, I'm sure one of you can check. But the importance of this, folks, is that uh, when this website goes on live, you will have your choice, the opportunity to go to this website, and it's a very interactive website. It will ask you a bunch of questions, but it also has the ability, I don't know how, it's out of my, out of my skill, skill level, it's beyond my pay grade, or, um, it has the ability to determine the speed that where you're connecting with the website. Uh, look at that. And, and the interactive portion of this is, as you're providing your information, and as the website is picking up on your internet speed, broadband uh, bandwidth speed, uh, it, it's putting that onto a map. And the goal of this speed test, uh, after six weeks, we'll analyze the information and the data, and this will help, help us in terms of um, seeking resources, uh, working collaboratively with uh, private sector partners like Poudre Valley REA, like CenturyLink perhaps. And, and so it's really critical that you be aware that this thing is going to go live as of July, uh, July 1st to August 15th, and we hope that you will spread the word and, and participate. The, the third thing I'd like to, oh, and as far as Glacier View Meadows and the activity that's been going on out there, I did put in a, uh, an email, I sent an email to our IT uh, director, and, and, um, uh, but he, he, he was off today. I haven't heard back from him, but we are aware of the activity. One of our staff people was up there and took some photographs of the trenching activity. I would, I would assume, and we'll find out more specifics and more accurate information, unless Paulina knows, that what's happening here is CenturyLink has received federal dollars in order to, per, you know, to, per, per, excuse me, to put in fiber optic line like they are doing out at Glacier View Meadows. So I think they're trying to comply with what, you know, what dollars uh, they've received in order to begin to light up some of these communities. So that's the best that I can offer at this point, but we will find out more precisely um, uh, what exactly is happening and what are the timeframes and who will it impact and how. So I wanted to share that. Um, oh, uh, County Road 74E, I better get to that before, before um, we just pause and take a deep breath for a moment, right folks? Um, so it was brought to my attention and to our attention on the weekend. Uh, there is construction activity happening on Red Feather Lakes Road, I think near uh, McNay Hill. Uh, that is to replace a culvert or a bunch of culverts. Uh, and, and that construction work will be um, uh, in effect through the summer, I think, uh, through August. And it's to, to help with drainage and, and, and flood control and culverts and all of that. Uh, the, the complaint was that there was an automatic uh, signaling uh, traffic lights that were not really synchronized to the realities of uh, what's on the ground, especially on the weekend when there's a lot of traffic going westbound up to Red Feather Lakes, Dowdy Lake, and all those other places, and then on the return. Um, since those complaints have been brought to our attention, uh, we have reached out to the construction contractor, and there is a traffic control contractor and this weekend, they will have two traffic control folks manually operating those traffic lights so that you won't have a eight-tenths of a mile backup of cars because they're on some automatic signal. As I understand that, I haven't been up there, but they've created these shoe fly uh, detours around the construction site, you know, so cars have the ability of vehicles to go up and down the on 74E. So that's what I know about that situation and, and I asked Mark Peterson, 
who apparently got stuck in one of those um, backups because he was going to visit his cabin up at Red Feather Lakes. Uh, they are fully aware of this. They have talked to the contractors. There will be some people on the ground this weekend, but it'll be helpful to know if it's how helpful it is. Uh, so more input would be welcome. And also during the week, if there are issues that have been happening during the week. Um, I'll, I'll hold off on this one, but there were concerns raised by some folks who live up at Crystal Lakes area about recreational sports shooting. Uh, and, and if folks want to know more about that, what I have learned, uh, I don't know if Susan is on this call, I'm happy to provide you with that information. Um, oh, the, the last thing I'll mention is that uh, we're not going to have a meeting in July, so we will not have our uh, regular Red Feather Lakes meeting in July, so you all can have a break from me. Um, and we will be having our Wellington meeting July 2nd, and I, Wellington Waverly Buckeye meeting, and our Fort Collins Laporte meeting July 11th. But just in the middle of the summer to take a break of this, break from this, and I am hoping, uh, cautiously hoping that maybe we could actually meet um, up at Red Feather, but I think we wouldn't be able to meet in the library in the normal place. We'd want to meet in a place like the Community Association building across the way, which has more space and where we would be able to, to spread out. So please keep that in mind. And we will have, uh, at that meeting, we will have Daniel Bowker with the, um, co uh, the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. And he will provide us with a detailed update on the um, elk fire uh, analysis pro provided by the division of the state division of, um, uh, of fire control and prevention. So that's gonna be our guest, at least that person on, on, on August, whatever the fourth or you know, whatever we do, I lose track of some of these things. And if you have suggestions about other folks, please let me know and we'll see, we'll do our best to accommodate. Hats off to the uh, Darlene and the, and, and, the, um, and the library folks. Uh, you, you've done extraordinary work uh, in, in conjunction with the Girl Scout Ranch and, and the, um, uh, the North 40 Mountain Alliance to provide you know, the, the food pantry that you've provided. Uh, my understanding is that you've helped about 105 families or more, uh, you know, homebound folks, people that are struggling, uh, between Livermore and Red Feather Lakes, 2,000 pounds of food a week. And I know that you have made some requests uh, in terms of uh, additional resources, and, and certainly the county is looking at that. I think Shale gave you some good ideas. I attempted to give you some ideas, and we'll continue to work with you on that uh, as, as the Girl Scout Ranch needs to transition into actually doing programs uh, for Girl Scouts, although I bet the Girl Scouts were volunteering uh, as well. I'm going to stop there. And please forgive me because I know I've exceeded my five minutes. I asked um, uh, Michelle to give me a virtual kick in the shin, but she's too kind, so that is not happening. Thank um, you for okay. your patience. You had good information going there, Commissioner, so I didn't want to stop you. But Russ has had his hand raised for a while. Yes. Um, and after that, we have a couple Q and A's. So Russ, I'm going to go ahead and give you permission to talk, and then you might you're going to have to unmute yourself. So if you're on the phone, um, it's going to be star six to unmute yourself. Or there's, if you're on star the nine. Oh, star I'm nine. sorry. Try star nine to unmute yourself. Or if you're on your computer, Russ, there's a little, um, in the bottom left corner, there's a little microphone that says mute. You'll want to click on that. Oh, there you okay. go. Okay. Can, can you hear me now? We can. Go ahead. Yes, my question is the recreational shooting that the commissioner talked about yes. is they have to drive on private Crystal Lakes Road to get back into the National Forest where they're doing their recreational shooting. And they're using weapons as high as 50 caliber, which travels for five miles and that those kind of weapons absolutely have no business anywhere near our neighborhood thank you russ well thank you sir for uh for bringing that to our attention let me 
Let me respond in what I know so far that could be done in the short term and what is being done in the long term regarding U.S. Forest Service. So my understanding of what's happening west in the national forest lands west of Crystal, the Crystal Lakes uh, uh, community is that um, uh, you know, folks are doing recreational sports shooting and apparently they're using high caliber uh, firearms and, and that would be a concern. Uh, based on a message that we got from the Crystal Lakes um, uh, District Ranger, Katie uh, Donahue, uh, she, I think she informed some of the folks that two short, well, first of all, one is that um, they have deployed more in law enforcement officers uh, to that area. So hopefully there are they're patrolling it a little bit uh, more, a little bit better, uh, Russ and, and, and folks. And but it's it's important to keep in mind that there are four uh, uh, law enforcement folks that that whose territory includes the Arapaho Roosevelt National Forest and the Pawnee Grasslands. But that's one short-term action that the Forest Service took, and that is to uh, to, to try to make available more uh, you know, more patrolling by by. U.S. Forest Service law enforcement. Uh, she also indicated that, uh, like what you just described, it would be helpful for them to get that input uh, because on a case-by-case -case basis, they will consider uh, closing down uh, an, an area if they have these very objective criteria and they will consider closing down an area to recreational sports shooting uh, if it's determined to be a, a big safety thing. So this information, I can certainly provide it, but I, I would encourage you to provide it um, uh, to the, um, you know, Reagan Cloudman is one person, uh, Katie Donahue, uh, so they know that this kind of activity is going on. So providing the input, uh, greater law enforcement on the road access thing, sir, what I understand is that there's a section of, on the road that's private, and I think Katie has suggested that you folks, I don't know how you would do it. I don't know if there are gates. You could prohibit, uh, you could prohibit people, the public, from going on that private access road, and that would that would have the effect of limiting, you know, folks that are going out into the uh, uh, the uh, national forest there and and discharging the firearms. So it, those are some of the things that were suggested in the short term. In the longer term, there is a um, uh, forest amendment plan, um, uh, excuse me, forest plan amendment. And they are looking at this holistically in terms of uh, areas that, um, that are unsafe for this recreational sports shooting to occur. And, and so there is a process underway, but that's a little bit more long-term and, and they're not going to systematically shut down areas until, or they'll do that in conjunction with bringing online some specific um, uh, uh, shooting ranges for this activity. We've had some success with that in Boulder County. So that there are some, there's an email that I got from Reagan Cloudman which provides more details. If you've not seen that, uh, sir, I'm more than happy to send that to you. But the long term is, you know, to develop this uh, strategy in relation to shooting ranges, to look at areas in the Arapaho National Forest that are really, really unsafe based on these criteria. I am planning to have a meeting uh, with um, uh, either both uh, the the district and the deputy district supervisors of the Forest Service, along with our director of, of natural resources, uh, Dalen Figs, to be updated, and we hope to do that in the next couple of weeks. I hope that's satisfactory for now. Thanks, Russ. Um, it also looks like Rich had the same, basically the same question as, as Russ about an update on the shooting of large caliber weapons and rapid fire weapons close to Crystal Lakes. You, you um, know, Michelle, if I may add two things um, to, to that follow up question, uh, which I neglected to mention in the, in the first um, uh, oration of this, and that is, uh, it was also informed if people are feeling, uh, you know, eminent, they're eminently in danger, of course they recommend you call law enforcement. So there is coordination between the U.S. Forest Service law enforcement rangers and our deputies. But as you all know, uh, we, we don't have uh, tons of these folks patrolling, and, and so they do the best they can. But if you're feeling eminently in danger, you know, because of these kinds of weapons being discharged, uh, it's an, I think it's appropriate to call the law enforcement and, and certainly to provide this input to the uh, U.S. Uh, Forest Service. Uh, 
Uh, and again, the other thing is that the email that I received from Reagan Cloudman with the U.S. Forest Service, if anyone uh, wants to receive that email, I did send it to Susan, uh, uh, Susan Ritter, who brought this issue to my attention. I am ha more than happy with the help of Michelle to get that information to you. Um, real quick, and this is a good transition. I guess it's not real quick, but this is a good transition to what you were just talking about, Commissioner. Jenny yes. Price has a question. She asks, can you please clarify safety in Red Feather Lakes, Crystal Rakes, Lakes and the surrounding areas? There seems to be conflicting information on who does enforcement, what can be enforced, and all the hows and whys. Specifically regarding trespassing on private property and random shooting on weekends. I, and that's from Jenny, is that correct? A person, Jenny, Jenny I, 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 in relation to the uh, recreational sports shooting, I, I feel like I've, um, I've addressed that question. If you feel like there are parts of it that I've not, please clarify. If you're talking about um, trespassing in, in general, uh, if, if someone is trespassing, uh, it is within your purview to contact, uh, you know, the appropriate authorities to, you know, inform them because that's against the law. Um, you know, the people who are supposed to be doing this recreational sports shooting, and this is an area that has not been closed down. It could be closed down based on the criteria if they hear from enough people like you and Russ and other folks and Susan. Um, but otherwise, I would say that local law enforcement, the deputies that are patrolling and, and certainly informing the U.S. Forest Service and, and, they, and, and asking them to expedite whatever processes they have in place to determine if, this, if these two areas west of Crystal Lakes subdivision, if they should be shut down. Commissioner, kind of a follow-up comment yeah. from Susan Ritter um, on what you're talking about. She says, closing the private roads in Crystal Lakes is not realistic as they have potential for serving as fire evacuation routes. When the boundaries for the ban were being determined, it was also suggested that the Forest Service consider blocking off the problem area with large boulders on the national forest land. Doing so would solve a lot of the current problems. Just a comment. Uh, thank you, Susan. And, and, and you, can, you can filter this stuff through me. Uh, but I think you have direct access to people like Reagan Cloudman and Katie Donahue, the Crystal Lakes uh, District Ranger. And, and, and it is my humble opinion that you folks need to provide this valuable input to them directly. You can certainly CC me. Uh, and I think they will, I, I didn't know about this Boulder thing. Um, I, I'm not sure what I could say about that, but they would be the ones who would be most informed to respond, whether that's a realistic short-term solution uh, and again, I reiterate that if enough people express concerns, it seems to me that would elevate this as a priority to determine whether or not those, a those areas should be shut down. Commissioner, one more follow-up from Jenny who asked the original question. Yep. Um, she asked, when people are in Crystal without permission, will law enforcement pursue charges and issue tickets? Uh, good question. <laughs> A valid question. I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that question, but Michelle, please take note of that and let us follow up with um, uh, the, uh, the sheriff's office. One thing I can say, Jenny, uh, two things I can say. One is at the next um, Wellington Community Conversation virtual, which is July 2nd, 7.30 a.m. to 9.00, we will have two guests and one will be providing more details about the broadband speed test thing that I talked about, but another one will be a, a captain from the sheriff's office giving us an update. So there will be um, a representative from the sheriff's office at that July 2nd meeting. If, if you folks would like, um, at the August meeting, in addition to having Daniel Bowker from the coalition talk about the Elks Fire report, I can um, invite uh, um, folks from the Forest Service to talk about this issue uh, and or, you know, folks from the Sheriff's Office. In, in fact, I did try to get uh, folks, there were four people that we reached out to in the Forest Service to, to join us 
to today, uh, and and they were not able to, not because they didn't want to, but it was a short term, it was a short notice, and there were con um, uh, scheduling conflicts, and and actually I think a few folks might have actually been on uh, a, a reprieve or a bit of a vacation since everyone's been working so darn hard these last three months. But I can have them come in August or ask them if that's what folks want. And I bet Paulini could do one of her wonderful little, or Michelle can do it too, one of her little polling things at the appropriate time. You know, do we want to bring uh, someone from the Forest Service to talk about this specific issue for the August meeting? Um, and uh, perhaps someone from the sheriff's office to give us an update. Sure. Um, Jenny, Jenny was just chimed in and said, yes, um, they would like some coordinated answers and solutions. Um, and then Susan Ritter had one more comment um, before I think we want to jump to the next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, but Susan says, the irony of not being out in the woods with COVID is that COVID has driven everyone up into the woods. <laughs> we had an, <laughs> an increase in illegal ATV use on 73C, underage children on vehicles and ATVs speeding on 73, and no evidence of consistent law enforcement at all. We need a deputy that is purposely assigned to patrol this area. Well, uh, thank you, Susan. Again, you're welcome to send that to me. Uh, I think directly to the, the people that can respond to that is the best way to go. Uh, CCing me since I attempt to uh, serve the people of District 1 and the entire county. Um, I, I can add to that, Susan, that uh, we, we've seen this, um, I mean, the, it's, it's, the, the usage that we're seeing at, at, for example, the four reservoirs that are part of the county system and in general our, our county um, open space areas has been extraordinary, the, the, uh, the increase. We're, we're adapting to that. We're bringing on some more folks, uh, but we're, we're definitely seeing that as well. And I know that up at Red Feather Lakes, uh, you know, I think all the parking lots for the trailheads, like to, to uh, Molly Lake and other amazing places like that, are just you know packed to the rim. Uh, and, and so we are aware of that. The Forest Service is aware of that. You know, one of the efforts that's more long term, and perhaps residents would like to have this as a way to engage is. There is something called NOCO. You might want to check it out on, on, on the website. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting, but it's called um, NOCO Places 2050. 2050, as in, you can believe it, the year 2050. And, and we want to resolve these things much sooner than that, of course. But because of changing demographics, increasing population, there are five counties working collaboratively with various public and private sector stakeholders, uh, outdoor recreation industry folks, forest service, uh, parks and wildlife, et cetera, uh, to look at um, uh, management practices. Uh, look at that. I just am amazed how these folks do these things. Oh. But you, you see from these pictures, this is an issue in particular that's affecting the, the, the natural areas, the open spaces along the Front Range in particular. And, and we are doing our best to look at what we can do, for example, in the medium term and certainly in the long term. So I wanted to bring this effort to your attention because here's it, you can see the players. It's an example of a collaborative effort uh, to look long term uh, you know, at some of these really critical issues. Thank you, folks. Gosh, so impressed. <laughs> oh, unmute, unmute. <laughs> Michelle. Sorry, for so, usually my space bar works, but it wasn't right then. Um, <laughs> so we have a couple people um, having continued comments about what we were just talking about with the shooting around Crystal Lakes. Um, and I will get to those, but Gordon has had a question for a little while, and I think it's only fair to go on to his question before we come back if there's time about um, the, the shooting and the trespassing and the enforcement. Yes. So Gordon has a really good question. Um, he says, how can we help get the word out about the internet speed test? Thanks, Gordon. And um, make sure that I give an update. One of the questions that Gordon might have posed was about the 
uh, the live of the, excuse me, the Livermore Satellite Maintenance Facility. So Michelle and Pauline, to make sure I, I talk about that a little bit. Uh, but to answer Gordon's question, um, first of all, uh, there is a there's a press release that's going to go out, and there is and, and Michelle can speak to this. There is a um, how would I say a, a comprehensive, inclusive uh, communication strategy, outreach strategy, and in fact, we were talking about this with. Uh, Mark Faffinger, our IT director, and Lorenda Volker, our um, uh, assistant county manager, who are directly involved in this broadband work along with others. Uh, and, and we discussed uh, other key partners that should receive this information. But it'll be on the website. It'll be on the next, um, it'll, information will be in the next, I believe, the next Larimer County really awesome connection newsletter. Uh, I'm going to put it out on my accountability report <laughs> that I'm hoping uh, I, I get done before July 1st. Uh, so, so there are different ways. And Gordon, if you have specific suggestions or like for example, if there's a next door thing with G Glacier View Meadows folks or a next door thing or a, you know, an email list with Red Feather Lakes and Crystal Lakes um, you know, and, and the Livermore folks, please get that information um, uh, to us and, and, and may, perhaps Michelle because we want to make sure we're, we're doing the outreach, especially we're targeting unincorporated Lamar County and in the unserved and underserved areas. And if I may add one more thing, sorry that I tend to add things to these, this, um, these conversations, but I think it's important and I think people would be interested. One of the things, one of the um, understandings that have come out of the discussions with this, you know, when the schools closed after spring break, and it was all online learning, and then you have a lot of kids and families that don't have access, don't have the connectivity uh, to, um, to to high-speed internet and, and broadband. Uh, one uh, sector of that is is folks who live in uh, mobile home parks, manufactured housing communities, especially folks in the quote growth management areas. So we've identified that as a real issue. Uh, regardless of how things, the, ho the hope is that schools are going to open up, but there's still going to be a need for kids to have access to have that kind of connectivity to do their homework and other things. So uh, one of the, we, we want to get this, this speed testing out to those folks as well, and we have some ideas around that, and we need to make sure that Michelle knows about those ideas. But one of the short-term things is that um, a task force has been developed um, that is focusing on some possible short-term solutions to uh, run fiber uh, to some of these uh, mobile home parks like uh, Poudre Valley Mobile Home Park, which is in the, in the GMA, like Park Lane, which is in the East Mulberry Corridor, uh, like um, uh, Hickory Village, for example. And we've, had, we've been building up these relationships. But it might be possible to run fiber optic, not to every home, because that's a, a bit, pretty big deal, but to um, the, the community, and then there's technology that people like Paulina understand uh, that where you can broadcast out the signals. So folks could have much more reliable, and the children in particular, but much more reliable high-speed internet um, rather than these mobile Wi-Fi hotspots that we've tried to do, you know, and, and the school district gets a lot of credit. So to me, that's an example of a uh, a really creative, innovative things, and I'm hoping and praying that we can actually pull that off and how we would pay for that and who would do it. Well, it turns out that when the voters approve the Fort Collins measure to create a utility around internet stuff, the connection thing, connexion, um, we check the ordinance and it does allow them to run line fiber beyond the, 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 the uh, city limits, like into the GMA, but we still have to figure out how we're gonna cost share that. And one possibility is that the county will be receiving uh, $30 million uh, in, in CARES Act federal dollars that are COVID-19 related. 15 million of that approximately will go to Larimer County and the other 15 million or so will go to the eight municipalities that are located uh, in, 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 you know, in the county. And it's for reimbursable expenses. So for example, if we can figure out the technology and the infrastructure logistics with the mobile home parks and the fiber, uh, and it, it's gonna cost, 
half a million bucks to do this, I don't know, uh, that would be, in my mind, that would be a very appropriate reimbursable, excuse me, reimbursable expense, uh, you know, to help these children have act, you know, reliable access to, uh, uh, to internet so they can do their homework. That's Mission. another long-winded answer. Good Lord. Sorry. I, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> One more thing to add. Sorry about that. Um, is that better now? Okay, it's not so bad. Um, we will put it out on next door too. Um, so I know that next door is used very um, oh, oh, quite a bit there in in that area. So we will put it out on next door as well. Uh, the link to the speed test. Um, and Gordon says that he has access to the owners of all the communications channels that he mentions. Um, and that he'll work with me to make sure we send consistent info throughout. So and that's great, Gordon. Thank you. And 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 again to re reinforce why this is really important. Uh, we need objective information. We need data to really identify where are the areas where the speed is and the connectivity reliability is not in place. With that information, we can go to the state. Uh, we can go to other public and private sector partners and say, for example, Poudre Valley REA. They would, the REAs are stepping up uh, throughout the country and even in, in parts of Colorado uh, because they have the electric, tr you know, the transmission lines and all of that. And it's to totally within their realm to be able to include fiber optic line, which they're doing in some cases, uh, but they're not lighting it up. We need to be able to make the case to them that there's a good business model for this. And, and if we can work collaboratively, we might be able to draw down some federal dollars, not necessarily CARES Act dollars, but uh, USDA rural development, uh, reconnect funds, all that kind of stuff uh, that would go to the entity, like perhaps CenturyLink that must be getting some money you know, to actually put the, you know, install the stuff that's gonna allow people to have access. So this is really, really important, this, this speed test. And now I understand how it works and, and the, the online portal and it's interactive and you'll see a map and it's, it's, it's pretty cool. Oh, would people like to hear about Livermore uh, Satellite Maintenance Facility? That's um, probably, um, I, we still have some comments regarding the shooting um, that we can get back to, but I think updating on Livermore is a good idea right now. And yeah, thank you, Michelle, you're such a marvelous host. Um, so what I learned about an hour ago or so from our road and bridge director, uh, Todd Jurgens, is that um, the work on the Livermore uh, satellite maintenance facility is scheduled to be completed in August. Um, and, and I think that shortly after that, one would presume that it will be quote operational which I think was the essence of the question that was presented to us. Uh, related to that was a, another question, because if you remember in those discussions, those deliberations, uh, there were two sites being considered. Site one is where it's happening. Site two was the other property. The question was, did we take into consideration the cost comparisons with um, the amount of dirt that had to be uh, removed to, you know, to fix that curve where the current site is? And according to what Todd Jurgens informed me of about an hour or so ago, excuse me, uh, they did, of course, in the overall projected bu um, uh, project budget, uh, they determined that uh, it would be an additional cost of $450,000. In other words, um, if we had gone with the other site, you know, uh, um, farther up the mountain uh, on the property that was being offered, um, it would have cost an additional $450,000 to do the, the road work or, you know, whatever was necessary. So that was one of the factors that the county considered in determining finally, you know, to go with the site where it's being built. Um, Commissioner, I have a, the poll ready to go. Do you want, do you want to try the poll first? Yeah, well, why not? Let's see what we can do. All right, we're gonna launch poll. So what oh. I asked was, should we invite someone from the Forest Service and or the Sheriff's Office in August? 
Good for you. Um, our options are yes, both, no, neither, <laughs> service only, or sheriff's office only. So we'll let people, most people are voting here. Overwhelmingly, I know you guys can't see this right now, um, but it looks like overwhelmingly we have people wanting both. So I'll give a couple more seconds to vote if y'all want to vote. And we'll stop here in about five. One person replied, Sheriff's Office only, and I will show everybody the results. Thank you, Michelle. Good for you. So there we go. It looks like most people want both the Forest Service and the Sheriff's Office um, in August. Great. So uh, we will do our best. And Michelle, if you could support me in that effort, uh, we could contact and talk to Alicia to reach out to the proper people. Uh, please note that now for the August meeting, I think we'll be successful in getting uh, U.S. Forest Service and or um, somebody from the Sheriff's Office. But note that we're also going to have Daniel from the, uh, Poudre, the, the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. But again, Daniel doesn't need a whole lot of time and, and a lot of it will be Q&A. We'll, we'll have these three folks. So it'll be a good meeting in August and, and God willing, hopefully we can do it um, in person. But I think we need to do it in a bigger space and we can work on that as well, Michelle. Uh, the, the the community association building across there on Firehouse Lane. Absolutely. Um, so we still have some comments um, regarding the shoot the the shooting that's happening. Um, and since it doesn't look like anybody has their hand raised, I'll just go through these comments, Commissioner, yes. um, and you can respond as you see fit. Um, Randall Roberts had the first comment, um, and it looks like he's still here with us um, on the meeting. So one clarification, the primary area of shooting concern is actually not west of Crystal Lakes. It is in between two non-continuous sections of Crystal Lakes, with shooting on the south direction directly threatening and having already hit homes within two filings within the association. Um, so that's what Robert has to say to clarify things up. Um, Susan Stevens says, there is a one mile strip of land from the south boundary of Crystal Lake's ninth filing and Dead Man's Road that is only one eighth mile in width. It also gets very crowded with campers. Every weekend there is shooting in that area. Um, Susan's home borders this area and multiple times they've had bullets flying onto their property into their pump house or over their heads. Um, they've made multiple calls to the Sheriff's Department over a 10 year period and have made multiple complaints to the Forest Service on 10 years that has not been effective. Um, and then Susan says, um, she thinks that she, respectfully commissioner, we have an immediate need for the Sheriff to patrol the violations on county roads who do we need to contact to get a committed deputy coverage, especially on the weekend? So she had a question. There, I don't recall the, okay, are there other questions related to those concerns? Uh, no, Michelle? Uh, those are our three um, kind of things about um, shooting. Uh, thank you. And, and I guess my response would be, first of all, just to express my appreciation for clarifying some of the things that I may not have gotten 100% right. And, and, and again, I, I don't know how else I can reinforce that this input is incredibly valuable. And I, I think the most direct way, at least to the Forest Service folks, to demonstrate the urgency of this matter is to contact, you know, somehow if, see if there's a way to compile this information and, and send it to Reagan, CC me. That is, um, if, if you're more comfortable emailing me, then do it. Um, uh, sometimes I, I you know, I, I, because I deal with so many emails, it's not always easy to be as responsive. But I know this is a, a really, really urgent thing. I'm better understanding how uh, dangerous it is. And, and I think this to me elevates to the point where the Forest Service needs to consider, you know, shutting this thing down if, they, if you know, based on their criteria. Uh, as far as the deputies not re, re, um, patrolling or not being responsive, uh, perhaps you could send that email to me uh, because I, I can't, I know we've had some folks up there 
at Red Feather Lakes, but I can't remember the, the captain or the, the deputy that's responsible for that area. Maybe Michelle knows, but we can certainly, um, you know, coming from me, I can pose that to the sheriff's office and, and uh, again, do my best to uh, inform them that there are concerns, you know, the shootings, uh, you know, patrolling the, the, the county roads and, and see what they say. Uh, some of it is a resource issue, I, I, but you, I guess you get tired of hearing that. Um, and, and you all know how to get a hold of me by email, jcafalas at larimer.org. Thanks, Commissioner. You're welcome. Um, we have one, and it's not necessarily in the um, form of a question. It's more of a statement from Herbert. Um, Herbert says, Crystal Lake needs better coordination between Larimer County Building Department and our Architectural Control Committee. Well, and um, once again, maybe Michelle, you could get that, that, you know, the contact person. I know we create a spreadsheet sometimes on this and I can certainly share that with our, our building department folks. And, um, and I think the deliverable on that would be uh, to have the building department folks connect with the uh, uh, Crystal Lakes Architectural Committee and, get to the bottom of things and figure out how to address whatever the um, concerns are. Sounds good, Commissioner. It looks like we have another question from Susan. Um, Susan's control is for, oh, Herbert says thank you. Oh, Susan's, you're welcome. <laughs> Susan's concern is patrol for traffic violations separate from shooting. Um, so it looks like we, ha we have concerns for both of those things. I think she wanted to clarify that, particularly underage drivers, speeding, and a need for immediate response, especially on weekends. Um, so we contact, should we contact you by email or follow up, or is there someone in the sheriff's office we should contact about this issue? Um, I, there, is, there are some folks in the sheriff's office, but I, I can't recall who they are. I know we have Captain, uh, I think it's Mike Reardon, who will be at the Wellington meeting uh, next, um, I guess next Thursday. And, and uh, at least for now, uh, friends and neighbors, uh, I would say contact me and I'll find out or you know, with Michelle's help here, um, but we'll find out. And, and, and you know, it, it's interesting. Again, that's why these things in my opinion are, are important and I hope you agree. So out of this conversation, I'm realizing that the last time we had uh, deputies patrol deputies who patrol the area up there was pre COVID-19 and the world has dramatically changed and you're seeing a lot more folks up there and a lot more visitation and and some of that is is illegal trespassing uh, some of that is not following the rules which you know which can put people in danger or at risk so all the more reason why we need to um uh you know get someone from the sheriff's office and and maybe with Michelle, I need to rethink. Um, I thought we could use a, you could use a break for me in July, but maybe we need to go back to the, that July meeting. I, I wonder, that might be another polling question, if, if Michelle or Polini can do that. Would you would like us to bring, have the meeting in July? Um, earlier I had said that we had decided to cancel it and I would just have two of these, but if, if folks feel strongly that we should have these updates sooner than August. Um, I think we can probably bring that back. But all good points, valid points that folks are making. Good input. I'm working on the poll right now, Commissioner, right. but we don't have any other questions and no one has their hands raised. So um, this would be a good time as I'm working on the poll for you to give any other updates that you, you maybe didn't well, get to. I, thank you. I'm I'm taking a look at my notes and all of that. I I think I've I've pretty much covered it. I it, clearly the um uh, the sports shooting issue is is a, is a concern. The number of folks that are visiting the Red Feather or Crystal Lakes area and the and the Forest Service land and the trails is a big concern. Um, so I think I've addressed that. And and the really important proactive thing is the is for folks to participate in this um, uh, broadband uh, bandwidth uh, speed test and survey. I think that's gonna give us a lot of really valuable information. Uh, so I don't have anything really uh, to add. 
All right, so I'm going to launch the poll then. Um, it's a pretty simple one. Would you like to have a meeting in July? Um, <laughs> Commissioner, I would guess that we're going to have to do a virtual meeting in July. What do you think about that? Uh, uh, <laughs> I'll take that under advisement, but I think you're right. I mean, we have to still, I mean, one thing related to that though, Michelle, is, um, and, and it's, it is relevant, uh, and that is, I, I, I may have alluded to this earlier, but the, you know, these different phases that we've all been dealing with that, that have come from the governor and the State Department of Public Health and Environment. So, you know, the stay at home, which as difficult as it was, did help us to be a lot more successful than other places to contain, control this novel coronavirus situation. We went from stay, stay at home to safer at home. And as of July 1st, unless something happens in the next week with with you know big spike in things we're supposed to go to this protect your neighbors phase and that is less restrictions you know more flexibility at the local level and and um i've seen some guidance on that they were wanting feedback i did provide feedback uh well what do you know look at that darn poll <laughs> uh is this poll of 100 percent wanting us to meet in july is this statistically valid 100%. Okay, well, uh, the people have spoken, um, and, and we'll, uh, I'll work with Michelle, and we'll need to let Alicia know, and, um, you know, maybe the priority would be to get, uh, you know, the sports shooting folks here, you know, there, and the sheriff's folks there, and maybe we could still keep Daniel um, uh, for uh, the August meeting, kind of spread it out, but we will uh, get that back on the calendar. And I will certainly consult with uh, Michelle and others. Uh, I was trying to get at that this protect your neighbors thing uh, might create some space for us to be able to do it in person. But a lot of it, frankly, is are people willing to do the public health protocols? Are people willing, uh, if we're in an indoor setting, even if we're six feet apart, to make sure that we've done the best you know, with our hand washing and that we're willing to wear uh, the masks when we need to wear the the masks, uh, that's gonna be really critical. But it could be that in our pr protect your neighbors phase, uh, the, you know, the, right now the maximum is up to 50 people uh, in an indoor setting, depending on the square footage and a bunch of other things. That may change uh, and, and that might give us more flexibility. But at this point, count on virtual because I, I generally listen to what Michelle says. Well, and Commissioner, there's always, and I, I don't, I shouldn't even promise this or I'm not promising anything, but there, you, you could think about doing an outdoor meeting. It's a nice time of year up in Red Feather. So um, that's an option too. I don't know where, I don't, I don't know Red Feather well enough to say that there's a place to do that. But something actually, actually right, spot on suggestion. I was kind of going there, but um, if folks have suggestions for outdoors, uh, I know there are great places. And then, you know, for folks who are, I, I don't want to exclude anyone, but maybe we could find a trail where not a lot of people go on and we could do a, uh, a hike in a, in a meeting. That would be fun. Yeah, I know um, we've had commissioners before do similar things, a hike. No kidding. So that would be fun. Um, we do have a couple comments, a uh, comment oh, and a question. So um, Susan Ritter wanted to say that she really appreciates your devotion <sighs> to listening to the people of Red Feather and being willing to accommodate their needs and requests. So I want to thank you for saying that, Susan. Um, Gordon says, at the last work session, this is a question, at the last work session the broadband task force had with the commissioners, there was a proposal to work with PVREA to deliver broadband to the rural areas. Is there anything to report about that? Well, I, I think I've touched on that, but um, there, we did have a meeting with representatives of Poudre Valley uh, Rural Electric Association this was last year, maybe in the fall, and it was a good discussion. And Poudre Valley REA at that time was still reluctant to get into the business of providing um, uh, broadband or high-speed internet, even though uh, they were you know, totally acknowledging that they were laying line, fiber optic line, where they were extending their electric lines out to some of their substations. So some of that infrastructure is being put in place. 
but it's not being quote lit up. And, and that's, that's what we need to figure out. So the update is that once we get the results from the speed test and the, our smart IT people analyze that information and provide a report to the commissioners, uh, that will give us the objective information to allow us to go out and have a follow-up meeting this fall with Poudre Valley REA to see if this new data uh, would give them more incentives uh, to get into the game. Because frankly, uh, there are other REAs in Colorado that are doing this. Uh, the statewide R R Colorado REA Association uh, is, is encouraging this. And I think we just need to um, work collaboratively and, and help build support a, a business model uh, you know, to make this happen. So I think the plan is once we have the data and the report, the, the plan is to do a follow-up meeting with Poudre Valley REA uh, in the fall. Thank you. And Gordon, Gordon has one, has a suggestion for where our July meeting could be. Um, and I made note of this commissioner, but he says the pavilion next to the Red Feather Lakes POA building would be a great place for the July meeting. So I made note of that um, and I'll hand that off to Alicia. If you guys want to work that out. Yeah, let's, um, and thank then, you Gordon, thank you. Another suggestion from Paul, and I'll make note of this as well. Um, is the local churches for an outdoor meeting or the Girl Scout Ranch. So thank you for all the suggestions, everybody. That's great. And, and let's, um, let's, let's plan on something outdoors if, that, if folks are good with that. And then we, we always want to have a backup because I, I understand it gets windy up there. All right. <laughs> I don't have any other questions right now. My husband says the fishing up in Red Feather is best when it's windy, so. Ah, interesting. <laughs> it's good to know. Um, I don't have any other questions and we don't have any hands raised, so uh, kind of your show at this point, Commissioner. Yes, uh, well, if it's my show, uh, it might be somewhat startling, but I, I would uh, recommend that we end the show a little bit early. Uh, no harm in that. I, I, I want to say once again, as always, much gratitude to all of you for who take the time to do this uh, together. I, I think there's value and I welcome your input, welcome your feedback. Uh, at 1.30 is the Red Feather Lakes Planning Advisory Committee, the PAC meeting. And I'm going to, it's virtual. I think it might even be a hybrid. And, that, and that's the other thing to consider. Well, we'll have to discuss it with Michelle. We could um, have a hybrid meeting, I believe, where folks who are comfortable meeting in person have that option and folks who may not be comfortable uh, could do it this way. So let's please keep that in mind. But the Red Feather Lakes PAC meeting starts at 1.30 and I've, one of the items on the agenda is that one of our IT folks, Mark Olson, I believe it is, um, will be uh, presenting much more detail um, and maybe Pam Marcus Bowsey uh, on, the, um, on the broadband speed testing. So more details and people who are much more informed than I am uh, will be there to answer questions about that. Um, and one thing, Commissioner, just for everybody to know, we do record this meeting and we'll put it up on our YouTube. It oh, usually yes. takes a few hours for the video to process, but if you guys want to go back and watch it, or if you have a neighbor who may be missed today, um, they can go back and watch the meeting as well. So I wanted and, to remind everybody of that. So I think we'll sign off, but I just want to also wish folks a happy uh, and safe and healthy uh, Independence Day. And, um, you know, please celebrate accordingly. And I, I just wish you all well, and I do care about you folks. Thanks. And thanks, Paulina and, and Michelle. Bye. Thank you, Commissioner. Bye.